Our next speaker, Jean Thomason, will describe what we know about HICPEC's plans for updating the isolation precaution guidelines. Thank you, Jean. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, you should be able to see my slides at this point. Okay. Yeah. So great. Um, hi, everyone. Like Lisa said, my name is Jane Thomason. I'm a certified industrial hygienist for National Nurses United. And NEO is the largest labor union and professional association for registered nurses in the U.S. And I have been following the CDC's process to update the isolation precautions guidance that um, Dr. Chan just shared with us for over a year. Once it became clear that the CDC was planning to weaken guidance, NNU started sounding the alarm. And so in the next 10 minutes, I'll discuss briefly what we have learned about the CDC and HICPAC's proposed updates and their process to make those updates. So a little bit about HICPAC. Um, this is the Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee to the CDC. HICPAC is comprised of eight members with expertise in infection prevention. All of the current members are affiliated with healthcare corporations and universities. They're appointed by the CDC. There are five ex officio members from other HHS agencies and 23 liaisons, primarily representing healthcare corporations and professional associations. None of the current liaisons represent healthcare workers or their unions. Um, and thanks to Mitch for dropping the link to the HICPAC roster in the chat. So HICPAC's process to update the 2007 isolation precautions guidance begins with a work group. The isolation precautions work group is composed of both HICPAC members and additional individuals from the infection prevention field, and they have extensive CDC staff support. They began meeting in February of 2022, and the work group meetings are closed to the public. The only access we have to their work is from presentations that they give to full HICPAC membership at public meetings. The work group's June 2023 presentation provided us details about their proposals. HICPAC was originally slated to vote on these proposals at their August meeting, which they then delayed until November because of our advocacy. CDC has posted the June workgroup presentation on their website, um, and I'll post the link in the chat here. Thanks, Mitch. Um, please note that this is a new practice that has changed because of our advocacy. Up until this point, the only way to get a presentation was to have actually attended the meeting. So that's another thing that has changed. Okay. Um, we also now have additional information about the workgroup's efforts. Earlier this year, NNU submitted official requests under FACA and FOIA, two different statutes, for workgroup materials. The CDC initially rejected our requests, but after receiving public pressure, HICPAC shared meeting summaries for the isolation precautions workgroup from February 2022 through May 2023. NNU has reviewed these meeting summaries on our website and posted them on our website um, so that the public can review them. Um, we'll, we'll make sure the link is in the chat. The content of the meeting summaries really confirms a lot of the concerns that we had about HICPAC and the CDC's orientation. Just to highlight a couple of those concerns, one is that the work group has consistently prioritized employer costs and profits under the umbrella of feasibility and flexibility over robust protections for workers and patients. The work group has sought for updated guidance to provide a basement recommendation upon which employers are then intended to build their infection control programs based on employers' own assessment of things like staffing levels, healthcare worker vaccination status, and patient immunocompromised status. And we saw how this approach worked during COVID with the CDC's crisis and contingency standards. Healthcare employers removed protections, literally locking up N95s and refusing to grant workers access, even while they were caring for COVID-positive patients. And then those employers turned around and said they were just following CDC guidance. And now the CDC and HICPAC are trying to adopt that approach for all of infection control. Another thing that we learned is that the work group has maintained a consistent and explicit orientation towards recommending fewer precautions than are currently employed, including for ventilation, respirators, gowns, and gloves. And from the beginning of the process, the work group has intended to rely on their own expert opinion where scientific evidence is lacking despite the fact that the committee has very narrow expertise represented and is missing some essential perspectives. 
In June, we learned more details about HICPAC's draft proposals to update their infection control guidance. We learned that the work group is proposing two new categories of transmission by air and by touch to replace the current faulty droplet airborne contact paradigm. And while this may seem like a step in the right direction, the work group's description of transmission by air actually fails to fully recognize the science on aerosol transmission. HIPAC remains focused on distance as the primary determinant of transmission of infectious diseases through the air. HICPAC's work group is failing to recognize the role that inhalation plays in aerosol transmission and the impact of other factors, such as time, dose, activity, and environmental factors. We'll hear a little bit more about that science from later speakers. In June, we also saw the results of an evidence review that the work group solicited from CDC staff to evaluate the effectiveness of N95 respirators. The CDC's evidence review is biased and incomplete and concluded that N95s were no different than surgical masks in protecting healthcare workers from respiratory viral illnesses. Issues with the CDC's evidence review included that they cherry-picked data from studies, ignoring data points where N95s were found to be more effective than surgical masks. They excluded one essential randomized control trial with zero explanation for why. In fact, their selection and exclusion criteria have not been publicly shared. They excluded an extensive body of research that has found that N95s are effective at protecting workers from inhalation of hazardous aerosols. And they also included studies that were flawed. Uh, some of these studies failed to evaluate whether respirators were used in the context of an OSHA compliant respiratory protection program. The CDC has said in multiple places that they are focused on, quote, real world evidence in how they are evaluating N95 respirators and other protections in this process to make updates. But the reality of what that means is that they are willfully failing to account for employer practices that actually undermine N95 protection. They are failing to account for practices like reuse, extended use, and lack of or inadequate fit testing and training. And instead, they're concluding that it's the N95 respirators that don't work instead of the fact that employers aren't implementing a full and com OSHA compliant respiratory protection program. It's clear in the work group meeting summaries that members started out this process to make updates with a goal of using N95s in fewer situations. Okay, so here's where the rubber actually meets the road though. The work group's proposals for protections for healthcare workers exposed to infectious diseases that are transmitted through the air. The work group is proposing three tiers of precautions within the by air category. If we can start at the bottom of the table, extended air precautions, they are saying would apply to pathogens like tuberculosis, measles, and varicella. This preserves the current disproven airborne droplet dichotomy. Novel air precautions would apply to MERS, SARS-1, and pandemic phase respiratory viruses like influenza and SARS-CoV-2. And they're saying an N95 would be used, but no airborne infection isolation rooms. This is a step down from current practice Novel pathogens need an airborne infection isolation room because we don't know yet how they transmit. And then this third category, routine air precautions, they're saying would apply to pathogens like seasonal coronavirus and seasonal influenza. So what's happening here is the CDC is recognizing that these pathogens transmit through the air, but then they're turning around and saying a medical surgical face mask is enough to protect healthcare workers, even though those types of masks do not protect against inhalation of hazardous aerosols. This distinction between pandemic and seasonal phase for the same pathogen sets the CDC up to downgrade protections for COVID from an N95 to a surgical mask. The bottom line here is that the is that HICPAC is proposing to update these precautions in name only, but when it comes to worker protections, they're not only refusing to recognize updated science, but they're actually moving backwards. It's also important to note that the June proposals did not include any mention of ventilation, patient screening and isolation, staffing, or other major elements of infection control. This is concerning given the work group's explicit goal is to have minimal standards in the updated guidance and to leave as much as possible up to in individual employers. Okay, so here's an outline of CDC and HICPAC's process, how they are creating these updates and where public input is being solicited by the CDC. The short version is that this process is largely happening behind closed doors. And this diagram is taken from the CDC's website and adapted. So step one, they establish a work group. There's no public access or input. Multiple requests for HICPAC and CDC to engage a broader range of experts outside of infection control, like aerosol scientists, 
respiratory protection experts, ventilation engineers, many of the folks that we'll hear from in this webinar today have been re rejected. And our requests for stakeholders, including healthcare workers, unions, and patients have also been rejected. And step two, um, the work group presents their proposals to the full HICPAC membership for review and discussion. At these HICPAC meetings, the public is allowed three minute comments. But at the August meeting, public comments were actually cut off after just 14 speakers, leaving many people unheard. Written comment is allowed, but they're not actually made available ahead of the next meeting. Step three, um, the draft is voted on by HICPAC and sent to CDC. This vote is currently slated for the next meeting, which is scheduled for November 2nd and 3rd. But the draft itself has not yet been publicly released, even though the meeting is approaching rapidly. In past meetings, HICPAC members actually voted before hearing public comment, although I'll note that this was changed at the August meeting due to our public pressure. The lack of a draft severely limits the public's ability to effectively engage in this process. And then steps four through six, um, you'll see the CDC reviews the draft, they post it in the Federal Register for public comment, and then the draft is sent back to HICPAC for finalization. And the CDC has been encouraging us to actually wait for this process, this point in the process, to, for the Federal Register posting to engage. But by the time it gets there, decisions have already been made and major changes are unlikely to happen. The CDC historically rubber stamps what HICPAC sends them. And so we have been urging engagement with experts outside of infection control and stakeholders before any HICPAC vote. Um, and I'll, I'll finish my presentation by saying that you can take action to make sure that the CDC hears from people like you. Um, you can first share your recommendations for what the CDC should include in their updated guidance with us. Um, the link is in the chat box, or you can scan the first QR code on the side. Um, we'll be collecting your recommendations and sending them to the CDC as part of a report on this workshop. This is the kind of public meeting that the CDC should be hosting themselves. You can also join NNU in urging CDC leaders to release the draft and hold public meetings to provide healthcare workers, patients, and other experts the opportunity to provide input before any vote to finalize updates. Um, you can scan the QR code on the slide. Um, there's a link there as well. I can drop it in the chat. And then finally, you can provide comment at the upcoming November 2nd and 3rd HICPAC meetings. You can either uh, provide your comment orally or you can send it in writing. HICPAC has more directions on their website for how to sign up or submit and I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to Lisa.